Oh, I've got, is it a dinosaur bone or wood? <laughs> it's on the bottom. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to what is now Curiosity Mine. Earlier this year, the Australian Opal Centre finalised a massive donation of spectacular opalised fossils and other specimens from Mr. Paul Sedawi. The collection includes over 450 pieces, ranging from relatively common bivalve mollusks to dinosaur bones, shark teeth, belemites and other sea creatures, turtle, crocodile, plant fossils, and even some bizarre and as yet unknown items. I had the pleasure of spending a day with Paul and looking at and discussing some of his favourite items from the collection. But just for a bit of background first, I asked Paul about his history in Opal and what brought him to have such an incredible collection of fossils. It started when I was probably a 14 year old kid. I always loved fossils, I loved rocks. And my actual, one of my dreams was to actually have a museum one day. So when I was 14, 15, I used to collect uh, kangaroo skulls and bones of animals. And under a uh, water tank, I had this little collection. So I came out here, probably about 89 came out here, bought a uh, camp and claim out at the four mile and that's where the adventure started and an interest in anything unusual, anything a fossil, I kept, I would never sell. And th that started uh, the whole career. I started dealing in Opal a bit then at the same time. And when I first used to buy buckets of rough, you'd actually find fossils in them. And this is going back 30 years ago. Fossils really weren't a collectible item and weren't seen as something you value. You valued it by what sort of opal you could cut out of it. So I started collecting uh, in those days. And then uh, at one stage, I did have a museum on the Gold Coast. We went that for four or five years, and then we decided we're going online. So now my main business, we sell online, and all the fossils actually got stuck in a safe. And I thought, what a shame nobody could see them. And I thought, OK, I'll donate them to the fossil centre. So it was a bit like a letting go, an emotional thing. Because then I had the museum on the Gold Coast, I could walk by, have a look and enjoy them, get, get a stone out. When I put them in the safe, it's a little bit different, a little bit cold, I'd, I'd pull out the favourites. So I think I'm happy I made the decision to give it to the Opal Centre and hopefully one day I can go back and still see them, enjoy them. So I'll let Paul explain his favourite pieces and I'll come back from time to time to talk about some really interesting items because there are a few things in this collection that we haven't talked about on this channel before so we'll dig into those when they come up. Enjoy! Now this is one of my favourite um, shell plates. This is from Cooper Petey. It's got such a variety of marine life in one little area. We've got such a variety of shells here. We've also got a little, right in the corner here, a stunning little fish vertebrae. We've got some nice um, gastropods on the side. And I just, such, such a delightful concoction of, of marine life. And it's just hard to imagine that the centre of Australia was once an inland sea. Now what we've got here is a, another shell specimen from Cooper Petey. This one has some polished uh, shell specimens in it. And what's interesting, these are all actually inside are full of sand. You can see on the side here, they're actually just called a skin shell. But all these shells here are actually got sand inside. It's the outside has just been opalised with colour. So there's still some gem colours through, through the uh, collection here. But it's uh, just a lovely display piece. What we have here is a, a delightful freshwater mussel out from the Olga uh, Field and Lightning Ridge. It's got a your navy sort of blue colour from it. And you look at the back and you can see it the amazing acrid formation of the uh, muscle. So the one side and the back is actually completely natural and only a little bit uh, polished side there. So it's like a specimen, but you can still tell that it's a natural freshwater muscle. And I just think it looks amazing. The, the way the formation, it's a solid opal. It's just completely opal inside. There's no sand or inclusions. You hold it up to light, you can look just right through it. Just solid opal, just, just pretty amazing. Now this has got to be my most favourite uh, shell. It was mined in the Olga opal field. It's actually such an incredible specimen. It's uh, in good pristine condition and it's never been touched. You have a gem bar sitting here and underneath there's a little red water bar. And normally when you get that, the top stone is going to jump. I made a mistake of showing this to a uh, opal dealer once and he took it in his hand and said, how much do you want for it? He wanted to cut it because there is a beautiful stone there. And so many times I've been tempted to knock the cap off. You have a strong cap here. 
The stone underneath this is going to be an incredibly beautiful stone and it'll be a very expensive black opal. But as a specimen for the shell like this, I just think it's so stunning, would have been a shame to do. But this is just showing how nature made it and the, as a specimen value, it's just so original and just uh, in pristine condition and that's how it's formed and that's how it stays. I've always been lucky, I had a few claims that produced a lot of gastropods. I've always kept them and donated them to the uh, Australian Opal Centre. And what the interesting thing is, they've gone through and they've found about six or seven different species of these gastropods. So we've got about six, seven varieties here of all different gastropods, which I find quite amazing. Some of them have gen colour bars through them. Uh, you'd never consider cutting a stone out of them, but as a, you know, a, a pristine specimen, some of them are quite amazing. So I'm just glad the whole collection got kept together. What we have here is a great little specimen. This is a gastropod and it's got its own natural host rock. Now this material like this is very similar to some of my collection from Lightning Ridge and you've got a little bit of formation shells on the back of it and uh, this is like an example where most of my collection has come from. Hey, what we have here is, is a book that Elizabeth Smith put out about uh, fossils at Lightning Ridge and what is great is that the little uh, gastropod here is actually on the front cover here. So that, that's fantastic. Then if you open the book up, just check these out. All these gastropods are here, are actually portrayed close-ups in the book. Here's the one on the front cover again. You can pick out a little gastropod and match it up here. So they're all being collected in the book here. And they just look stunning. Yeah, what I've got here is a nice little specimen from uh, Cupipedia of a Balamite. There's the Balamite here, and here's a bit of a shell. So what I've done, I've just bought these as rocks over there, and the mine will just hit the area, disclose that there's a little bit of the Balamite. So I've just cleaned it up, just exposed it. So this is the Balamite on a host rock. So if somebody wanted to, you could uh, take that off. You'd have a really stunning blue, bluey bluey sea green type of colour there but you can see the colour there at the end there but uh, as a natural piece just let you understand how it forms but this one is just left in its natural position. You know here, here we have another, another piece and this is one of my favourite ones. Now the miner in Cupipedia had this probably about 20 years and he's actually there's been an actual fracture on the stone he's just set it in the silver and he just wore it around his neck and I've always asked him you ever consider it one day you don't want to get sick of it just keep me in mind and then one day I did a big deal with him and I spent a fair bit of money buying rough and I said would you want to throw this bellamite in and he actually gave it to me as a gift and so to actually turn around and actually re-gift this on I get a lot of pleasure just looking at the colours. And this is just a stunning piece of balamite. I, I think it's just stunning. And I get a lot of pleasure just looking at it, knowing that it's going to a new home. The colour is there, the intensity is still there, and it's just a, a beautiful specimen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what belemites are because they're kind of fascinating and they're probably not what you expect. Belemites are an extinct order of cephalopods, which is the group that includes squid, octopus and cuttlefish. Belemites were saltwater creatures, so they lived in the ocean, which is why we see opalized remains of belemites at the Cooperpedi opal field and not among the Lightning Ridge opalized fossils, which were primarily freshwater. The most common part of a belemite to be fossilized or opalized is the guard, which is the cone-shaped pointy bit that Paul is holding here. So the guard is the most common piece of a belemite to find fossilized, but there are instances of soft tissue becoming fossilized as well, such as in this example from Germany. Here you can see the guard at the front of the creature, the head and body in the center, and at the back of the creature you can see the outline of its arms with dozens of hooks or claws made from chitin, which is a material similar to keratin in your fingernails, and it would use these hooks all over its arms to net and ensnare its prey. Looking at the guard, you'd probably think that it's also a weapon of some kind, but in reality it evolved to help the belemite control its buoyancy. Inside the guard is the phragmacone, cool word number one, which is a chamber that contains a bunch of separate little chambers called camerae, which is cool word number two, 
and they can be filled and emptied as needed by a vessel called the siphuncle, which is cool word number three. So the Belamite Guard is a bit like the ballast tanks on a submarine. It allows the creature to change its center of mass and compensate for swimming at different depths and pressures. It's really cool stuff and really pretty when opalized. Now what we have here is a nice uh, placey soil specimen. This came from uh, Cooper Petey. And just look at the formation of the bone structure. It's still fairly evident even today. And uh, this is just a great specimen. And it came from a friend of mine in Cooper Petey. He knew I liked, the, I liked uh, collected fossils. So he gave it to me as a gift. And I'm just wrapped because it's such a beautiful specimen. And uh, I've always cherished it because it looks so unique. Well, this is a great specimen. Had a miner out at uh, Graham and rang me up one day and he said he's got a dinosaur bone for sale. I'll come out and have a look at it. So I drove all the way from the coast to came out. He said it's got some colour and I looked at it and it's actually just a timber replacement. So it's not a dinosaur bone, but just look at it. It's got the formation. It looks like a strong bone, but um, when you look at it real closely, you realise it's just a, a wood replacement. So he was disappointed and so was I. But it's just a nice, still a great specimen to make people aware that not everything you see is a bone and uh, you've got to get it uh, verified to make sure that uh, if you think it's a fossil, it is a fossil. And what we have here, we have a great wood specimen. This is wood specimen replacement and it has some gen colour bars through it. This piece actually came from uh, Wycliffe's. So it's like a tree. You can see the rings of the tree coming through. And uh, we had some miners come over from, um, from Wycliffe's and uh, I swapped a bit of black opal for it. So I swapped a bit of black opal for white opal, but it was a specimen I liked. When you see how the colour is in, embedded in, in the, uh, the wood fossil, and I just think it's just, just amazing to see. It's a great specimen. Well, this is a pretty interesting little piece. It, uh, this just came out of a, a bucket of rough, but you can see how it's probably been, it's just a vegetation replacement, but when you look at this, it looks actually like a tooth. Sometimes a lot of miners look at the markings on the side and think that's a, a tooth, but what it is is just a, um, a vegetation replacement. We turn it over in the back of it and look at the formation behind. Like It looks a bit like a muscle, but this has been uh, most likely a vegetation, so it's probably a bit of a mystery opal. As a specimen for what it is, it's a nice mystery little piece. Now this is another specimen that came out of just a bucket of rough. And oh, to be truthful, I was very tempted to cut it. It looks most likely just a vegetation fossil. And there's a jemmy bar, and you can't really make out the, the uh, as a plant formation, but you can see there's a nice little colour bar here. Now the colour is sitting on black, so that will actually cut a black opal. And even though the colour bar comes to the top of the specimen, I thought it was pretty neat. So I looked at it and said, will I cut it or not? No, I'll keep it and I've left it as it is, but even now I just re-look at it and go, there is a nice stone there. And it would be worth a fair bit of money because there's bits of red, it's going to be a multicolour stone. Anything comes on black is worth a bit of money due to its rarity. But then again, the rarity as a specimen, so I'm glad I left it like that. What we have here, these are probably some of the, the uh, my most prized, smallest fossils I had. These are actually shark teeth, so they've been opalized. So what's so rare about them when you consider that it was all fresh water around the area of Lightning Ridge, and this is a, a seawater creature. So it's probably come up, eaten and, and gone, but it's lost some teeth. So I'm just happy that they've just stayed in the collection. They're small, but the significance of them is just so rare and unique. And I'm just glad that they're, they're staying together in the collection. I said earlier that most of the opalized fossils at Lightning Ridge are freshwater, so these little shark teeth are one of the exceptions. In this case, the shark or sharks have probably found their way into the freshwater waterways at prehistoric Lightning Ridge in search of food or something, and they've lost some teeth along the way. Modern sharks do this too. It's not at all unusual for marine sharks to travel quite some distance from the shore up freshwater streams and rivers. Cretaceous Lightning Ridge was a really fascinating environment because it was a bunch of freshwater lagoons and channels not too far from the edge of the great inland sea of Eramanga. So it has an incredible variety of creatures and plants and it's very different from the other Australian opal fields. 
What we've got here is a couple of unique little uh, fossils. These are actually uh, from a turtle. There is a turtle shell. And you can see this one, look at the green fire coming from it. Then you've got the indentations here for the secondary plate underneath it. So th these are two pieces that are actually in Elizabeth Smith's book on lightning ridge fossils. So if you had a stone like this just sitting in rough, uh, it's not easy, you've got to really know what you're looking for. It's a little bit of the bone structure you try to see, but many miners just bypass it because they don't think it's a fossil. So if you look at this one here, it's got a uh, lovely, you know, nice colour, but it's still not easy to identify. But if you know what you're looking for, it becomes pretty obvious. One of my favourite things about turtle shell fossils is that they often preserve this really finely detailed texture that creates a kind of velvety effect when it's opalized. It's a kind of texture and pattern that you don't really see in other opal formations. It's pretty unique to opalized turtle shell. Now here we've got amazing little, uh, it's a claw. This came out of a parcel from Kelly's with all crystals. So I bought a crystal parcel and saw this in and thought it looks unusual. Like my first indication is just a tooth because you've you got like a tooth-like structure through here. But uh, it turns out it's, a, it's like a claw from, the, uh, from, from your feet. Now there is a little bit of play of color opal here. The whole parcel this was in was nothing but crystals. And to find something like this in there, it was just like a delight, not really knowing when I saw what I had. I thought, well, that's a bit of an unusual tooth. So it, it's been um, verified to be uh, a claw off, off the feet, so pretty neat. Now this is a, a great vertebrae specimen. This came from the uh, four mile field. And uh, I've had this so many years. As a specimen, it's, it's such a strong, sturdy looking piece. It is like a little bit of a um, cracked bone there. And sometimes you try to imagine, is that a cracked bone? It got injured in an accident or, or a fight, but it's just amazing, you see little pieces like this. They would have joined somewhere along here, but uh, I just find as a specimen, the bone is just, it's a strong, sturdy looking vertebrae. The animal's probably a theropod, and I imagine it'd be one of the biggest, probably dinosaurs were found, I'd imagine. It's uh, still, the, the jury's out on it, we'll still find out later. But, you know, when you look at the tail, there could have been a bigger vertebrae here. This could have been off a large animal. But uh, that's just one, one amazing specimen. I got a lot of pleasure looking at this one. This, this just came out a little ice cream bucket of potch and colour. Little stones, it was on the bottom and it hasn't been damaged. It's actually in pretty good uh, condition. You got the, it's virtually a fish jaw. So one tooth is missing in the back. Uh, the front one, look how sharp it is. So that's a really neat little specimen. And that, I would have got that probably 25 years ago, just, just laying in a little bit of potch and colour. And the amount of fossils that were in this material, because when you look at it, there's no opal colour. So from miner's point of view, you can't cut a stone. Okay, it's interesting, but so I was just, that's how this one came across. Just a really neat little specimen. Yeah, actually, I was going just through a small bucket of rough and I came across something, oh, this is really unusual. I couldn't identify it, and I thought I had new endangered species. And so I wasn't that happy when it turned out it's just a crocodile jawbone. But when you think of it, it's still rare, it's unique. You can still see some of the uh, parts of the teeth left here. And it's still an amazing little specimen, unusual. And funny enough, I've only had one or two um, you know, crocodile fossils. And that's the end of a tail there. And just looking at it, the bone doesn't really look that old. But even though we're still talking 100 million years old, and look, look at the cavity through it, it looks still pretty neat. Amazing specimens. Look, look what we've got here is something I find pretty amazing. So this has been through a, um, an agitator, which is, gets tumbled the whole time, and I haven't touched it. The whole parcel came out and this was in it. So. A lot of the sands disappeared. It's called septarian opal because the opal's just filled a void in the crack. But it looks like to me a heart. And I liked it so much that I actually made a poster out of it. You can see how you got all the sand filling the back. The way it's formed, it's like just a mystery of nature. It looks so stunning. And it may not be valuable, but it just looks so unique. 
and something like that I just collected because it's unusual. It's not a high value, but just damn interesting. We've looked at septarian structures before in this video with Dr. Elizabeth Smith on false fossils. Make sure you check that one out for more information on septarian formations. We've got here another uh, opal oddity. This is actually given to me by Steve Arasic as a gift. I've known Stephen for a while, and so it's been a knobby sliced open. Look at that, like the formation. It's actually hollow inside there, but just gives us some idea of being a gaseous formation. Uh, I imagine the piece might have been down the ground like this, come up that way, so there's no colour in it. This is a particularly fascinating piece because it shows some interesting insights into the formation of opal at Lightning Ridge. It's clear from this piece that the opal has formed in a cavity within the claystone and that it's formed from a liquid that has seeped into the stone as there are clearly no channels into the cavity. You can see how the line of the opal's formed in layers. So it's been like a second deposit come down and it's formed and you've got different layers coming through there. It's also interesting to consider the surface tension of the liquid as you can see the meniscus or the curve at the top of the liquid layer and you can see the way the liquid has clung to the inside of the cavity. This is a really fun piece and it tells us a lot of things about opal formation which is a pretty intense field of scientific research. But uh, as an oddity you'd see it on the ground you wouldn't even think there's opal in it. So that was uh, a knife gift I got from Steve. So th this is an interesting piece. Now this is some white cliffs and it's a uh, pineapple. It's actually got some beautiful uh, gem colour here, but the rest of the uh, formation, it's, it's quite an amazing specimen. This was mined in the 50s in white cliffs. An American guy bought it, uh, went back to America, and later in life he had ill health, so he sold it to, uh, I imagine, pay some medical bills. And it was a friend helped him out and uh, he decided to offload it, so I gave him a rock for it, and I brought it back to Australia. So this has been from Australia to America, back to Australia, and now you can see this is the Australian Opal Centre. This one is of same area, Wycliffe's. That's the only place in the world where they find, find these specimens. They're in high demand for a collector. So th this one is actually, it's been taken out of the wall. It hasn't been cleaned up, so to clean it up, you've got to sandblast it, and clean all the little bit of uh, the, the rock on it and get it back just to opal. But this would come up a stunning blue little specimen. But at the moment, this is how, how a rough specimen looks before it's cleaned up. It's still a beautiful specimen, great, great formation of the crystals. Pineapples are unique to the White Cliffs opal field in New South Wales, and they're a great example of a pseudomorph. A pseudomorph is when a fossilizing material, which in this case is opal, replaces and takes on the shape of something else. We see this all the time in opalized fossils, where the opal has taken on the shape of a piece of bone or the shape of a piece of plant material. Pineapples from White Cliffs are pseudomorphs because they were originally crystalline growths of something like glauberite, which over time has been replaced with opal. This is especially fun because opal itself is amorphous or non-crystalline. It doesn't naturally form into these kinds of shapes. So this is one of the rare instances where you'll see opal taking on a crystalline shape, even if it's only pretending. I'd actually, you know, suggest anybody who has a collection who could afford to donate it. It's a benefit to our industry, it's a benefit to the town, it's a benefit to the scientific community, be a benefit to the tourist. I think you'll get a lot of pleasure with, with your name still being on the donation. And it is something that your, your great grandkids can come and admire one day. The Australian Opal Centre is building the world's greatest public collection of Australian opal and rare opalised fossils, as well as opal-related geological samples, cultural items, reference and archival materials, and contributions like Paul's extensive collection greatly enhance the scientific and cultural significance and the just plain awesomeness of the collection. With the first stage of the new AOC building underway and set to open in a year or so, more of the thousands of items in the AOC's collection will be able to be shared with the public, providing access to these incredible objects on literally a whole new level. There are really exciting things to come. This video was made with the support and participation of the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge, with special thanks to Jenny Brammel and of course to Paul Sedewe for his contributions to both the centre and to this video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are in the description. And thank you for watching.